This past week, we celebrated Valentine's Day, one of the most expensive holidays on the calendar. At least that's how most men see it. <clears throat> the figures for this year haven't come in yet, but 2023 Valentine's Day spending hit $26 billion. One of the highest on record, according to Forbes magazine. Even at that, though, Valentine's Day is not the most expensive holiday. Christmas tops the list, followed by Mother's Day. Father's Day, however, comes after Valentine's Day. Hmm. What do we purchase on Valentine's Day? Well, among the most popular gifts include candy and sweets. 44% of people said they bought that for their Valentine. Greeting cards, 33%. Flowers, 32%. A romantic dinner, 29%. Jewelry, 10%. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, that adds up to more than 100%. And you're right, because some people do more than one of these things. Now, the list also included cosmetics and beauty products. 4% of people got that. I'm not sure that's a really good idea. <laughs> Might be sending the wrong message. That in a gym membership, probably not a good idea. Or a household appliance. Yeah, don't get a vacuum for Valentine's Day. Really bad idea. Now, these gifts that we talk about, you know, the candy, the cards, the flowers, the jewelry, uh, these are all appreciated. But in our message this morning, we're going to see a gift of love that was much greater than candy or flowers or jewelry and at a much greater price. This month, we have been looking at what I'm calling Scripture soap opera. It's the story of the Old Testament prophet Hosea and his relationship to his wife, Gomer. We see how their marriage and family life mimics a modern-day soap opera. But it even more so reflected the spiritual condition of the Israelite nation at that time. And this morning, we're going to move into chapter 3 of Hosea, what I think is really the pivotal moment in the story where Hosea's wife, Gomer, is literally bought at a price, which is the title of the message today. So let's turn to Hosea chapter 3. It's a short chapter, only five verses, but it says a lot. Hosea 3 begins with the desperate predicament in which Gomer found herself. Hosea had married her. They had one child together, according to the text. It was a son named Jezreel. She had two other children in which Hosea is not mentioned, so they probably weren't his, which is indicated by their names, not pitied and not mine. <laughs> Real subtle. And then, as we saw in the first part of chapter 2, Gomer left home. She took off. She left the kids with Hosea, and she ran off with whoever would have her. Apparently, she was um, free to anybody that took a liking to her. And I'm sure word got around town of what Gomer had been doing. But as we get to chapter 3, things had changed. And verse 1 describes the depth of her depraved state. The Lord said to me, go, show your, wife, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Love is certainly a keynote in chapter 3. 
In fact, if we want to call 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter of the New Testament, we might call Hosea 3 the love chapter of the Old Testament. The word love appears four times just in verse 1. And it's the same word. We might wish it were a different word, but he uses the same word every time. Here we see really the depth of love. Walter Kaiser writes, In no prophet is the love of God more clearly demarcated and illustrated than in Hosea. Here we see God's love very vividly. He tells Hosea, go, show your love. The NIV translates to your wife again. Literally in the Hebrew, it just says woman. And there are some scholars who wonder, is this really Gomer? You know, maybe God's saying, okay, time to move on to somebody else. I don't think so, though, because the word in the Hebrew is there again. So this is a repeat of something he's done before. He's not starting something new. I think the NIV is correct in putting wife here. He's going after Gomer. Go show your love to her. The analogy of the Lord's restoration of his faithless bride Israel would be lost if this was somebody other than Gomer. So I think it's the same one. You know, the first thing you encounter is God is taking the initiative. He tells Hosea, go again and, and love your wife. I mean, it had been impressive enough had Hosea found that in spite of everything Gomer had done, he still loved his runaway wife and, and that he must have perceived, wow, this must be what God's love is like. That's not what happened. God goes to Hosea and says, look, I want you to go and get, Jose, or get Gomer and bring her home. And I can just imagine Hosea's like, you want me to do what? <laughs> I already followed you once. Look where it got me. You want me to go and get her again? You know, try to get inside his sandals for a minute here. Try to put yourself in that place. Feel the hurt and the anguish that he felt. Sense the pain over the rejection of his love. Identify with the dawning of this demeaning realization that she is caught in an addictive compulsion. Empathize with his desire to block his ears to the gossip about his wife's adultery. You have to know, Gomer was on the lips of every gossip in town. Oh, did you see who she was with last? Oh, wow, you know. Stories are going all around. And you know that gets back to Hosea. Allow your heart to be broken as he learns, not only has she had other lovers, she's just gone from one man to another, but then she gets involved in this cult prostitution at the temple of Baal and then he finds out that now she's being sold as a slave that all comes back to him no longer a plaything of other men no longer a sexual object of the fertility rights now she's just a tool the vicious exploitation of the slave traders. And don't forget about the shame. I mean, this is a prophet's wife who's an adulteress, a prostitute, a Baal worshiper, a sex slave. All of these feelings that are going on. You know, listen to your own voice chime in with Hosea's pathetic cry of anguish. If I never see that woman again, it'll be soon, too soon. Right? Come, this guy is human, all right? He's like us. Imagine if you were going through what he's going through, and then God comes along and says, Go get her back. Bring her back home. 
It must have sent shockwaves through his heart. He had to have been, at the very least, hesitant to go through with it. And there's no glossing over this unpleasant truth. In order to show his love again, it's going to open these wounds all over again. He has to make himself vulnerable again so that she may reject him all over. And God reminds him, the adultery is still in progress. She's not begging to come home. She still wants to be out there. She still wants to live that life. But God says, I want you to go get her, bring her home. Why? Because this is God's love in miniature. This is an acted out living parable of what God is doing for his people. Now, I mentioned earlier the word love is used four times in this verse. You see, the love that Hosea is to show for his wife, the love that her lovers is showing to her, the love God has for his people Israel, the love the Israelites have for these sacred raisin cakes. You're like, what in the world is that? Well, it was this kind of a, a treat that was made from pressed grapes. And it was used as part of the worship of Baal. Part of the orgies that were going on, they had these things. And so it just became a byword for part of that worship. And they loved it. Now, yeah, I for one wish that they'd used a different word for love, right? You know, God's love is the same word that's the love for all that she was involved in. But it's the same term. And I think it just goes to show how God loves us, but how often we love things. We love stuff. We don't reflect the kind of love God has for us. I remember when I was in Bible college, we had a preaching class. We all took turns in preparing and delivering sermons. And one of the students was from Thailand. And so English was his second language. And he was going to present a sermon on love and talk about the different Greek terms in the New Testament that are translated love. But he started off like this. He says, you Americans have one word for love. You say, I love God and I love pickles. Now, you know, that cut me to the heart, right? You know, that's pretty convicting. But isn't that true? We use that word, you know. I'm in love with my car. Boy, there's another conviction. Uh, you know, we love a sports team or we love our favorite food or whatever it is. Same word we use to express God's love for us. The fact that Gomer still loves the raisin cake. She was still caught in the slavery of her addiction. But God told Hosea, you go and buy her back. Take her home with you. As a vivid demonstration of God's love for his people. In spite of their embrace of idolatry. Now the next truth that we see is the demonstrative price which Hosea paid. Now, I understand, as we read this verse, it's not going to mean anything at first, but it will quickly become clear what the significance is. Verse 2, Hosea is speaking, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Okay, big deal. Here's the significance. In those days, the going price for a slave was 30 shekels of silver. Do the math. Hosea was getting Gomer at half price. This is a blue light special, right? 
Now, we're not told why she was only going for 15 shekels of silver. But my guess is she looked pretty rough. I imagine that, uh, you know, she had lived a hard life and, and it was starting to show. Her clothes probably stunk. Her hair was probably not taken care of. Her body may have been scarred. It may have been diseased. She was in rough shape. Maybe they started the bidding at 30 pieces of silver and nobody would take it. We don't know. But we know that in the end, Hosea bought her for half price. She was, in the words of one contemporary writer, a half-priced whore. And the same author pictures the scene. The whole crowd is now doubled over in laughter and disbelief. One persistent villager can't let such disgrace continue, so he rebukes Hosea. Get a grip, man. You're embarrassing yourself. That's the woman that slept with half the guys in this village. She's made a mockery of you. She's shamed you beyond what any guy should endure. She didn't even want to be with you then. And look at her now. But Hosea fights his way through the crowd as he cries out, I don't care what she looks like. I don't care what she's done. I don't care what she's become. I, don't, I know she didn't love me as much as I loved her. I know she has a lustful addiction to have sex with other men, but I love her. And I will never stop loving her. That's my wife. Get out of my way and give me my bride. Pretty powerful scene, isn't it? All the drama that you could hope for in a daytime soap opera. I'm sure rumors turned to ridicule as these Israelites watched open-mouthed as Hosea goes and scoops up Gomer and lovingly carries her home. Little did these people know that they were witnessing a living object lesson designed by God to illustrate the truth of their own lives. That same author applies this to today. Hosea's scandalous, shameless, one-way love for his unlovable whore is a mere snapshot of God's grace to us. While we were still whores, Christ eagerly climbed up on the cross to redeem us from the slave market. I apologize if that language offends some of you, but that's the depth to which Gomer had sunk, and quite frankly, that's the depth we have sunk to as well. Now, it's true that Hosea got Gomer for half price, but we need to remember that God redeemed us. He paid the price for us at a much costlier price tag. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. No ransom has ever been so costly as what Jesus paid on the cross for us. Lloyd Ogilvie comments, It is beneath the cross that we move beyond the exposition of the verses of this chapter about God's unbroken love for, from his broken heart. We never really know how much someone loves us until we know to what degree they're willing to suffer for us. Suffering is the measure of love, and it's this quality of suffering love that is the focus of Hosea chapter 3. The price that was paid... In Gomer's case, it showed the depths to which she had fallen. She was only worth half the price of a normal slave. But the price with which we were redeemed shows us how much God values us. It cost him the life of his son. 
Think about uh, collectibles, all right? People collect things. And what might look to you like an old beat-up ball with someone's name scrawled on it might not be worth very much. But if that name is Babe Ruth, it's worth a lot. I remember when I was little and collecting baseball cards. And I played with mine. You know, I had no idea that they could be worth something someday. But boy, you have the right card. It could be worth millions. Where other people say, it looks like a piece of cardboard to me. The value that someone puts on it. The price they're willing to pay. Jesus was willing to pay the ultimate price because that's how much God values us. Even though, to be honest, we're more like Gomer, only worth half price. Just the depth of God's love. But the chapter isn't finished. There's still three more verses, and these speak of the divine possession Turn, if you would, to verse 3. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Afterward, the Israelites will return And seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Verse 3 suggests that Hosea did not immediately enter into intimate relationships with Gomer when he brought her home. He waited a while. Maybe it was to make sure that she would be true to him. Maybe it was to make sure she wasn't pregnant with someone else's child. Or that she wasn't carrying home a disease. Who knows? But the idea was, you're going to come home, you're not going to go out prostituting yourself again, and you're not even going to have relations with me for a while. Now the reason for that, God was using Hosea's experience here to foreshadow what was about to happen to the people of Israel. They were going to lose their freedom for a while. Not too many years after Hosea lived this story, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, was defeated. Samaria, their capital, was destroyed. Many of their people were exiled far away from their home, never to return. Others from other nationalities were brought in and settled into the land. They didn't have their freedom, just as for a time Gomer didn't either. But I think there's more to it than that. I think this also demonstrates that when God purchases someone, when he redeems us, it's not so that we could just go do whatever we want. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, you've been bought at a price. You've been paid for. You belong to somebody else. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Even as Gomer had been redeemed, brought home, loved again, it wasn't to go right back out into that life of sin. And the same is true for us. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the debt for our sin. Not that we could go and live in it all over again. He says, you're mine. I want you to live with me. I want you to live for me. I want you to love me. Be loyal to me. There's an expectation there. Why? Because we've been bought at a price. We are not our own. We belong to him. Now, at this point, it might seem kind of bleak. We're kind of ending this chapter on a sad note, but it's not because there's hope. You'll notice that at the end of the chapter, 
Israel will return. And that's the key word. The word return is used 22 times in the book of Hosea. It's a recurring theme. If you will return to God, God will return to you. If you will return to God, He will return His blessings to you. He will pour out more than you can ever imagine. In verse chapter 6, verse 1, Come and let us return to the Lord. Hosea's message is really summarized in the last chapter of his book, chapter 14, verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins. Receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Now, we aren't told what happened with Homer. Homer, always do that. Hosea and Gomer after this. They just kind of fade from the scene. Starting in chapter 4 is all of the messages that Hosea is preaching to Israel, kind of applying the object lesson. But we're not told what happened. We don't know if they lived happily ever after. We don't know if Gomer stayed true or not. But we can know how our story ends. So I'd like to conclude with the, some words from that writer I mentioned earlier. God loves you because of who he is and because of what Christ has done. Whether you are depressed, suicidal, underweight, overweight, good-looking, ugly, dumb, smart, popular, socially rejected, happily married, divorced, physically fit, physically disabled, funny, dull, whether you are Judah or Joseph, whether you're Gomer or a Proverbs 31 woman, you have won the heart of God because you are human. God doesn't save people who have it all together. He saves whores, prostitutes, porn stars, Bible college professors, and stay-at-home housewives who wear head coverings in church because God loves to create righteousness out of nothing. Grace. If this stuff ever gets old, we might as well throw away our Bibles. I never get tired of seeing tears stream down the cheeks of people like Gomer when they talk about Jesus finding them on the streets. To hear former streetwalkers talk about grace and how Jesus values them despite their past, that's better than 10,000 church services. And I can't think of a better mirror of Jesus' pursuit of me. We are all vile sinners, addicted to the muck and the sludge of our own depravity. We are victims beaten down by other people's depravity. We are therefore walking magnets for God's scandalous grace. We are Gomer. That's what this story is all about. Each and every one of us is Gomer. We have all turned to our own way. We have all rejected the love of God. We have all strayed from His path. And if these words resonate in your being, please know that someone loves you even more than Hosea loved Gomer. His name is Jesus. And He paid the ultimate price for your redemption. His very life. He still loves you. He still wants you, regardless of the havoc sin has wrecked in your life. Valentine's Day is past. You know, maybe you got flowers or candy or jewelry. Maybe you didn't. But the greatest gift of love, the costliest gift of love, is still available. It's yours for the taking. Receive God's grace by faith. Know His love in your life. And you can know how your story ends. You can live happily ever after. And turn that soap opera into a fairy tale. If you will take 
God's love that is offered to you.